Luke chapter 5. Luke 5. Amen. It's hard to read your your sermon with when it's upside down. So, Luke chapter 5. Uh, let me begin by saying that the gospel is not for good people. It's for bad people who know that they're bad. And, uh, you know, the only people who can receive salvation and enter in God, into God's kingdom are those who admit their need. Amen. Amen. Those who understand, you know what, I'm a sinner and I, and I uh, need God to forgive me. And so the gospel, I'm going to preach this message, it's called the glory of the gospel. And I want to talk to you about really the wonderful effect that the gospel has upon people who embrace it. And there's, there's an old poem uh, called The Touch of the Master's Hand. How many remember that old poem? And uh, uh, there have been many artists that have sung uh, songs to that, uh, to that poem. And so I want to play one for you tonight. You might, uh, Michael, uh, you may, I'm not sure how this is going to sound up there, but you may need to turn up the volume as it plays if it doesn't sound loud enough out there. And so, so, um, I want to play this for you and, and listen to it because, because God is, is a God who, who takes what it seems to be worthless and reveals the true worth of it, amen. And when God touches a life, he, ma he makes us realize that that life is precious and that life is valuable. And, and when Jesus ministered to people, uh, one of the things that was revealed is how precious people are. And so we're gonna read about, about uh, uh, Matthew, uh, Levi, the tax collector and, and how God changed his life. And you know, that's just one story of all the millions of lives Jesus has touched throughout the years, Amen. through the through the centuries. And, uh, and uh, you know, our lives are very much like that. So put yourself in the position of this old violin uh, as we listen to this song, okay? So let's go ahead and, and listen to it. Waste much time on the old 
a very powerful story that is, huh? I did another one, bro. Praise God. Amen. That uh, was such a powerful uh, song and poem. And uh, as we read our scripture this, this evening, I want you to keep in mind that God, that Jesus, when he looks upon mankind, he, he knows the the pain he knows the wreck he knows the the mess that we've made of our lives he's seen how we're scarred and battered but uh how I many know it doesn't matter to him Amen. because uh, he has the power and the ability to change our lives and so let's read this luke 5 uh 27 luke 5 27 Yes, uh, it says, after these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he left all rose up and followed him. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house, and there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them, and their scribes and and uh, uh, Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we're asking for your grace. We're praying for the help of God, the anointing of your Holy Spirit, that you would have dominion. Lord, bring understanding to our hearts, Lord. Use our lives to make a difference in the lives of others who don't know you yet. And we thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The glory of the gospel. Jesus said, uh, those who are well have no need of a, of a physician, but those who are sick. Amen. How many of you have heard uh, stories of someone who uh, felt a pain or, or something was going wrong in their physical body? And they went to the doctor and uh, after they were examined, they discovered that what they were suffering was actually very serious. And... Uh, and how many have heard of people who were told it's a good thing you came in because if you did not come in, this would have killed you yeah. or this, this would have been really bad for you. And so that happens all the time. And so think about this. How many people do you suppose wait until it's too late to uh, come to Jesus, to repent and then end up passing into eternity, unrepentant and unforgiven. See, the, the beauty of the gospel is that it calls men and women who have made a wreck of their lives to come to Jesus, amen. Uh, in his statement in, in verse 31 and 32, Jesus reveals to us uh, this powerful truth of his purpose and coming. Uh, in verse 31, those who have who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance amen it tells us of his whole reason for coming into the earth and that is to save uh, those who are lost lost to provide the cure for the fatal illness of sin I mean you know that there's no one on earth that can cure sin the only one who can cure that is Jesus Christ. Amen. And there's only one cure for the greatest sickness called sin, and that is the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross for you and I. And so here is the importance of the gospel message. It is to proclaim to men their lostness, but to give them the good news that they can be found. Amen. And so a person 
won't seek the help of a physician unless he's sick. We don't go see our doctor just because we feel like it, just because we like them and, and uh, you know, want to talk to them. People go to the doctor when they feel a pain, when they get concerned about something. Some people won't even go to the doctor until they're very seriously ill. And, but that's just the way we are. And so we're the same way as human beings. We tend to be the same way when it comes to God. We don't naturally come to God unless we're in a desperate situation. Um, I was thinking of the prodigal son. I mentioned uh, the prodigals as we pray for them. The prodigal son uh, found himself in a far distant land in less than ideal circumstances. Uh, his troubles that he was dealing with in a famine and in starvation and in no friends uh, and no one who cared about him, uh, that, was, that was actually his own making. Those were what you could call self-inflicted wounds. And that is the position of most people in the world that you know we suffer uh, greatly from our own bad decisions, our own self-will, our own desire uh, to, to have our way, uh, no matter what the cost. And so, but the prodigal uh, son, when he came back and his father uh, uh, saw him, this is what the father said. He said, this son of mine was dead and is alive again. Yeah. He was lost and is found. Amen. That is, that is the, the essence of the gospel. But the son, think about the son for a moment. The son had what, what I like to call a self-revelation. You know, he came, uh, Jesus said, it, you can read the story in Luke uh, 15. It says that here he was wanting to eat the food that he was serving to the pigs. He was so hungry. And it says that he had this self-revelation. It says he came to himself uh, some translations say he returned to his senses and he asked himself a question. Why am I here starving when there's an abundance of food in my father's house? He said the servants in my father's house have plenty of bread to eat and here I am wanting to eat husks that I'm feeding to the pigs. You know you're hungry when you want to eat pig food. <laughs> and so, so he had a self Revelation and the man who does not recognize his own circumstance, his own fallenness or lostness is in a desperate place. And this is where the gospel is so awesome. Amen. This is where the, the glory of the gospel lies in that, in that when a person realizes, you know what, man, my life is such a mess. The gospel gives that person the greatest of all hopes. Amen. Yeah. That there is forgiveness for my sin. There is a new life in Christ Jesus. The trick is to get a person to come to that place in their life where they realize, you know what? You know, I've tried things my way. I've done this. I've gone down every different path there is. And why don't I try surrendering my life to Jesus? Yeah. I've done everything else. I've tried counseling, I've tried medication, I've tried relationships, in and out of relationships. I've tried, I've tried uh, you know, uh, opposite sex, same sex, all these things, and none of it satisfies. None of it makes my life any better. So let's look at this man, Matthew, for a moment, because he really is an interesting character, okay? So it says... In verse 27, after these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi. <coughs> so here's Levi. He, he's a tax collector. The King James calls them a publican. In Matthew uh, chapter 9, verse 9 and 10, uh, it, it's written this way. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. Now, as it ha now it happened as Jesus sat at, ta at the table in his house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Okay, so that's, that's in the Gospel of Matthew, 
And what we're reading about is the man named Matthew. In other words, he wrote this of himself. So, you, you know, it was kind of his testimony. Uh, it was a confession of sorts as to what kind of man he was when he met the master. Okay, so Matthew was a tax collector. His, uh, his other name was Levi. And so under the authority of Rome, a tax collector collected a specific amount of money for, for, the, for the nation of Rome, and anything that he collected beyond that was kept as a personal profit. Okay, so it was well known that tax collectors overtaxed people. And so they had a license from the Roman government to tax whatever they wanted. And, and so it was actually a license for extortion. And, and the reason they, they could do it was because their franchise as a, as, a, as a tax man was enforced by the Roman army. And so they could, they, could, uh, they could accuse someone of not paying their taxes and, uh, to, the, to the Roman authorities, and Roman authorities could go and take everything they had, arrest them, put them in jail, make life very, very difficult for them. So for a common, ordinary citizen, it was better to just pay uh, more than what was owed. It was better to pay what the tax collector was charging you. That it, that was better than being arrested, having your uh, all your property seized. And so the common person, when they when they thought about tax collectors, tax collectors or publicans were considered to be the lowest of the low lives in their society. They were they were viewed as traitors by their own people. Because in essence, what they were doing was they were taking advantage of their position and their, their authority given to them by the Roman government to just enrich themselves. And, and many of them did. Uh, you read about Zacchaeus in Luke's gospel and it says he was the chief tax collector and it says, and he was very rich, had lots of money and his money came the same way by extortion. And so... Jewish tax collectors were considered scum of the earth. They uh, were barred from the synagogue. They, they couldn't go to synagogue because the people were, they hated them. I remember uh, uh, in the, the, the film, the old film, Jesus of, of Nazareth, when, when, uh, uh, when Jesus called Matthew and, and uh, went to his house and Peter was so upset because uh, because here's this tax collector who takes his hard-earned money, enriching himself. And uh, I, re I remember Peter's words. He goes, doesn't he know that, that, that Matthew is my blood-sucking enemy? <laughs> he was so upset, you know. And, and it, it kind of captured the view uh, that Jews had of tax collectors. They were forbid forbidden to go to synagogue. Uh, they were forbidden to have any religious or social contact with their fellow Jews, and they were ranked with unclean animals, like swine. They were considered uh, uh, congenital liars. They, they were ranked with robbers and murderers, but they, they could do it legally, so they were really hated. They couldn't give uh, testimony in any Jewish court. You know, they, they were, they were low lives. So here's a guy, Matthew or Levi, as, as uh, Luke calls him, who is one of the most despised and despicable people. And Jesus comes and says to him, follow me. And the Bible says that, that he dropped everything and followed Jesus. This was radical transformation. Amen. This was something that was unheard of. Here's a man who is one of the lowest of low lives and the master comes and he touches him. 
This man's life was changed. Amen. There was something in Matthew that responded to the call of Jesus. Something down in his heart was like, you, you can imagine that he was amazed. Here is this famous rabbi. Here is this man that everyone is talking about. This man who heals the sick and raises the dead and opens blind eyes. Coming up to him and saying, follow me. You can imagine he was shocked at being invited by this man to become one of his followers. He was used to being hated. He was used to being rejected. He was used to being looked down upon. Yeah, he had money, but, you know, his, his only friends were other tax collectors and prostitutes. So his life was, was a shambles. But there was something down in his heart that, that hope was birthed in him when Jesus said to him, follow me. And it says he left everything behind. Amen. It says he left all, rose up, and followed him. You know, that's very significant that he did that because to leave his station as an agent of Rome meant that once he forsook that, he could never go back to it. Because word would have gotten out to the Roman authorities and said, oh, he quit, huh? Well, we just get someone else. No, he can't come back. And so here's Matthew. He knew what it was going to cost him to follow Jesus. And he willingly paid the price. I mean, no, sometimes it costs us to follow Jesus. Amen. It really does. Of all the disciples of Jesus Christ, Matthew is most likely uh, the one who made the greatest sacrifice of material possessions to follow Jesus. He was never going to be able to go back to that lifestyle. And so here's, here's a powerful truth, and that is that when the master touches a person and they're converted in their heart, they leave behind their past. They leave behind their sin. Amen. This is how you can tell when someone's really converted. They, they, they change. Amen. I don't need that anymore. I don't need to, to get drunk anymore. I don't need to smoke dope anymore. I don't need to, to have an immoral sexual life anymore because I find satisfaction in Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus is, is all I need. So here's Matthew, he, he leaves his past life, he leaves his old ways, his sins no longer appeal to him. Matthew lost a career, but he gained a destiny. Amen. Amen. He forsook his career, but he gained a destiny. Amen. He lost some material possessions, but he gained an eternal fortune. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He lost his temporary security. You know, his temporary financial. How I many of we, we kind of get nervous if our financial security gets shaky? He lost his temporary financial security, but he gained eternal life. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so here's this man. He would, he would be what you would consider a loser if, if they put Matthew up for auction. <laughs> Nobody's going to give you anything for that man. But think about it. Jesus gave his life for that man. Amen. Amen. And he gave his life for every person. Yes. What's interesting about, about Matthew, it says in our, in our text in verse 29, it says, then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. And there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. 
You know what's interesting here is Matthew, his life was transformed by Jesus. And you know what the first thing he did? He threw a big feast, invited Jesus, and then he invited all his friends to come and meet Jesus. Amen. Amen. Other tax collectors, and who else? Tax collectors and others. And in Matthew's gospel, I believe it says, many tax collectors and sinners. You know, there was a, there was a pretty seedy crowd that, that Matthew hung around with. I want to tell you something. Those people, they got to meet the Messiah. Amen. He was so excited, he threw a party. <laughs> he invited all his sinner friends to meet Jesus. Hallelujah. I mean, that's, that's, that's what needs to happen. Yeah. Amen. That all those people that we used to hang with, you know, and, and, uh, and, and sin with, that now they're not influencing us to do evil. We're influencing them to do good. Amen. Amen. We're, we're bringing them to meet the Lord and Savior who touched our lives. You know, this is one of the reasons that we like to do outreaches and, and various things. It gives people an opportunity who maybe won't come to a church service like this to come to an event and hear the gospel. Amen. The hayride, you know, the hayrides we did, that was the whole purpose of it. When we were in the parades, our, the whole reason we went was not to win the prize, but to preach the gospel. And to bring that message to people because people need to hear. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call on him in who they've never heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? Jesus said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Wolves like to eat sheep. They like to have them for lunch. And the world doesn't necessarily like the church, but I want to tell you, the world needs the church. Amen. Amen. Here's this man, he's, he's a wicked sinner. And Jesus didn't care who he was or what he did. He came right up to him and said, follow me. And there was something in Jesus that inspired this man to leave everything and to come after him. Amen. The religious world didn't like it. The scribes and the Pharisees, they were indignant that Jesus would associate with them. They were indignant that, that they, they didn't care that the scum associated with Jesus, but they didn't want Jesus to associate with them. That if you knew what this person was, you would not be with them. Remember the story of Simon, the Pharisee invited Jesus over and the sinful woman comes in and she's washing his feet with her, her hair and her tears and, and Jesus is, is letting her and Simon is thinking in his own heart, eh, if this was a man of God, he would know what kind of this woman this is and he wouldn't let her even touch him. And Jesus rebuked him and said, said this woman is doing this because she loves me. And whoever is forgiven much, loves much. Amen. Yeah. But those who are forgiven little, love very little. And you know what the real difference is? Is that some people realize they need forgiveness. And others don't think they need it. They think, I'm okay. I'm all right. You know, I've, I've talked to people many times. And that, you know, you want to give your life to, oh, I'm good. I'm good. And you're... You know them and you're like, you know perfectly well. They're not good. They're in trouble. They're hurting. They're bound by drugs. They're bound by alcohol. They're bound by pornography. They're, they're in a world of hurt, but I'm good. You know what that is? That's denial. That's denial. Oh, no, I'm fine. Well, folks come to a point in their life where they realize, hopefully, before it's too late, that I'm really not good. I'm really desperately in need of forgiveness. Amen. And what's awesome to me about the gospel is like the song that, that I played for you, the, 
the touch of the master's hand is something that seemed worthless to the world. Once the master's hand touched it, it became priceless, a glorious thing because of the gospel. The glory of the gospel is to take a person's life that was a wreck and make it into something beautiful and valuable. Amen. Amen. You know, when you, when you talk to people who've been converted and, you know, God has miraculously changed their lives, sometimes you look at them and they, you hear their testimony and you think they're lying. Like, no, I don't believe it. You used to smoke pot. <laughs> no, really? No. Can't, I can't see you smoking pot or getting falling down drunk. Oh, yeah, we did. And it was a shameful thing. But Jesus, the master came, and he took a life that was worthless. Sometimes our worth in the world's eyes was zero, but even in our own eyes, it was zero. Did you ever feel worthless? I know I did many times. But I thank God I met Jesus. Somebody told me about the Savior. Yeah. And I got saved. I came to him Hallelujah. and he transformed my life. Yeah. And I'm here to tell you that he's not done doing that for people. He is still in the business of making masterpieces out of junk. <laughs> Amen. He can do it. Yeah. Amen. You know, when you go to Las Cruces and as you're going down the hill, uh, going into Las Cruces, you've seen that road runner on the side up on the hill. Have you, you ever stop to look at it close? I, I always say, I'm gonna, one day I'm going to stop and look at that thing close. Because when you look at it from the from the highway, man, it looks real. It looks real. It looks good. Just giant size, you know. And so one day I was I was going to pick up someone from the airport, and I I was early. Their, his plane was going to be delayed, and so I said, "You know, I'm going to stop. I'm by myself." So I pulled into the rest area there, used the restroom, and then I I walked over to the to the road home. <coughs> and I stood there looking at that thing, and I was like, "This thing is made with junk." There's old crutches, there's old radios, the whole breast underneath where it's white is nothing but flattened tennis shoes, white tennis shoes. And you know, it's like, I mean, I was amazed, you know, the eyes and everything about it was, wow, the, the artist that did this uh, just had a genius mind to be able to take all this junk and make something that looks like a real road runner as you're driving by. And I'm telling you, God can take the wreck and the junk that was our lives and make something glorious because the gospel yeah. works. The gospel is powerful. No matter where you are, what, what position your life is in right now, he can change it. And the words that he said to Matthew all those years ago, he still says to us today, follow me and if we follow him with our whole heart he'll change our lives and our lives won't be worthless anymore they'll be worth something Amen. and they'll be glorious and it's not our doing but it's him the thing I like about that song is that the, the, the violin just seems so plain and, and you know not worth a dollar no one would bid on it but once the master touched it it became a glorious thing amen and that's how human life is when Jesus touches our lives amen so let's uh, take that to heart let's believe God amen that he's going to do great things in us uh, through us that he's going to that there's a bunch of other old violins out here in Grand County that the master's going to touch and he's going to do miracles in their lives. Amen. And we're going to look at him and say, wow, what an awesome thing God is doing. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads together as we
bring this service to a close. I want to uh, give you an invitation if you've come tonight. And, you know, it's one thing to to be religious and uh, to to you know have a, a knowledge of God in our in our mind in our head, but it's another thing altogether to have Jesus living in our heart. Allowing him to have his way. See, that's what Matthew did. He gave up his old life and he gave himself to follow Jesus with all his heart. That's why we still read about Matthew. That's why there's a, a gospel named Matthew. Because here was a man whose life was worthless, but it wasn't worthless to God. He responded to the call follow me Jesus is still calling to mankind to all of us follow me give up your way to go his way and so tonight as we bring our service to a close God's calling you to follow him with your whole heart if you haven't yet made a decision to really really give up your life to do God's will. You're, you've been holding it back for whatever reason, but tonight you hear his call. He's saying, follow me. He's saying, I want to touch you. I, I want to make your life something beautiful. I want to make your life something good. Something worthy of the kingdom of God. Worthy of heaven. You know, the Bible talks about Christians who suffered terribly at the hands of persecutors in the book of Hebrews 11, and it says, of whom the world was not worthy because they were people who belonged to God, belonged to Jesus. The world wasn't worthy of them, but they were worthy of heaven because of the power of God. You're here tonight, and you're not right with God. You want to completely surrender your life to Jesus. If that's you and you want prayer, just lift up your hand. Lift it up and hold it for just a moment. Say, yes, Pastor, pray for me. I want to surrender all to Christ. Thank you. God bless you. Anyone else, quickly, lift up your hand. You might be out there watching this sermon later on YouTube. We're going to pray a simple prayer to receive Christ. And uh, you can pray with us. And God will hear your prayer and He will forgive you. He will change your life. You'll need to get involved in a good gospel preaching church. Amen. So pray this prayer with me from your heart. Mean it from your heart to God. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. That you died on the cross to take away my sins. And that you rose again on the third day. Thank you for loving me. Forgive me, Lord, for all my sin. I give my life to you and ask you to come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to do your will from now on. In Jesus' name, amen. This evening, God is still touching lives. You know, we, we might be saved as Christians, but you know what? We still need the touch of the master's hand in our lives to help us to, to grow and to become all that God wants us to be. And so we're going to take some time and we're going to open our altar for prayer and God's speaking to you and he's drawing you. Amen. And you feel that in your heart that, you know what, God, I, just, I need you to touch me. I need you to, to continue to make me what you want me to be. He's still saying, follow me. Amen. And we have to choose every day to follow Jesus. So tonight, amen, this can be a turning point in your life where you say, you know what? I'm going all the way with Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm not going to hold anything back anymore. And so you, you can uh, come and find a place to pray at the altar. And God's going to meet you here. We're going to sing that song again, Your Blood. Speaks a better word. Michael's going to put it up on the screen for us. Amen. As we sing that again. Let's all stand together and worship God. And I'm going to open the altar. If you want to come and find a place to pray, 
God's going to help you. He's going to meet you here at this altar. He loves you. Amen. Your blood speaks a better word than all the empty things I've heard upon this earth. Speaks righteousness for me and stands in my defense. Jesus, it's your blood. same thing applies for every one of us. Amen. So let's let's take that to heart. Amen. Let's live with this hope and this understanding. You know what? My life can be different because of Jesus. Amen. 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 And so we're gonna we're gonna uh, let you go tonight. Amen. Remember all that's going on this week. We're gonna be working here, uh, preparing for the uh, for the walking path. Brother Otto is gonna preach Wednesday night. Amen. So you come. And then uh, uh, take flyers, invite people to come to this uh, this event, amen. Uh, really, what it's all about is bringing the glory of the gospel to people so that they can hear the voice of Jesus saying, follow me, amen. amen. And so let's, let's remember that, let's do our part, and uh, let's be like Matthew and say, hey, come check this out, amen. amen. And see what God will do, hallelujah. Pray for the event. Pray for good weather uh, all week that God will give us favor uh, all the way through uh, past uh, Easter. Amen. And so, praise the Lord. So let's pray. Let's ask God's blessing as we dismiss our heads about. Amen. Uh, David, would you pray? 
I thank you, Lord, for the word that you brought today to us, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for all that you do in our lives. And I pray, Lord, that you give us the strength, the patience, the courage, and the guidance to go out and seek all the sheep that are lost, Lord. And that we ourselves will go forward with you, Lord, and not slide back. But pray for all, we pray for all those people that have slidden back and all the people that are in need of salvation and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.